Hello, this is Peaceful Anarchism on the Voluntary Virtues Network every Thursday at 1 p.m. And you could also find me on the Conscious Resistance YouTube channel and, and website. So um, today we're going to do a debate. Um, I'm going to be arguing anarcho-capitalism. And my friend John Zimmerman, old high school friend, is going to be defending <laughs> um, regulated democracy. Uh, John? Well, uh, I think that uh, speaking about democracy will go for another time, but okay. basically defending government, the government. existence of government and whether or not we need it. Okay, all right. The existence of government. Uh, so John Zimmerman is, John is a, uh, a lead software engineer at an e-commerce company. Uh, so that's where he comes from. So, <laughs> all right. So, um, so we're just going to start off with some basic. Oh, by the way, uh, in the description of the video, I'm going to put in a link to the logical fallacies. We might we might mention some uh, throughout the uh, discussion. You know, if I commit some, I assume John will let me know. If you commit, you know, John commits some, I'll I'll let him know. So we sure. can try to keep this, you know, um, on the straight and narrow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, keep things transparent at least so that yeah. the viewer is kind of informed as yeah. to what's happening in the discussion. Yeah, sure. logical fallacies are always good to um, sort out the uh, fluff from the substance, right? <laughs> sure, <laughs> um, absolutely. All right, so we're going to just start on some basic uh, defining definition of terms. Uh, oh, so I think before we start, a good a good background to give is that the fact that you and I are um, old high school friends. Uh, we have a long history of debating things off the school bus and playing chess <laughs> against each other. So we have a, a long history of um, oh yeah thrust and parries when it comes to logic and <laughs> discussions. So <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. In high school, I, I started uh, the chess club, and, mm -hmm. I, and I ran it for like what three or four years. And John was I was a, the vice president. John <laughs> was a frequent yeah uh, my partner. Partner yes. in crime, so it was a uh, hmm? it was a joint venture. <laughs> Fun times. Fun times. Yeah. So all right. So you ready? Um, so we're going to sure. start off with a uh, basic question: What is government? Mm -hmm. um, right. Do you want to start off? G give your basic definition. What, what? How would you characterize government? Um, sure. So basically, government is a um, organization or structure by which um, management or uh, management and administration over a piece of land or territory achieved. That's basically what government is. Um, I'm going to get into that, but uh, go ahead and talk about it. Okay, well, um, administration and management of a piece of land. Okay, so so to me, that uh, just, just taking those words um, is not necessarily indicative of government in, in my definition because, uh, well, I'll just give you my definition real quick. My definition is government is a monopoly on initiated aggression um, over a given geographical region that is funded by uh, taxation, which I would assume is theft, but that's another thing to argue. It's funded by taxation and propped up by the belief in the myth of authority. Um, uh, well, hold on. So you said a monopoly over aggression. Now, do you think that a state government in our United States, do you think that a state government is a government? Yeah, so there's there's many different levels of government, right? So you got federal, you know, state, city, town, all that, right? Um, but there's fundamental differences between the federal and the state, right? Um, that that a state cannot do, for example, print their own money, for example, wage wars, for example, spy on their own citizens, at least to the extent that uh -huh. the federal government is able to. So, and, and oh yeah, and also to uh, to uh, to mention also um, the reason I mentioned initiated aggression is because um, my definition of government must include the mention of force, right? Because government is, by its very nature, involuntary, right? We must, we have no choice but to pay taxes. We have no choice but to obey the arbitrary laws that are, that are written and enacted by our political masters. Mm, to varying degrees. Um, I mean, basically, through representation, so in democracy, in, uh, we have representatives that uh, create these laws, and we have control over who those representatives are. And well, I, uh, actually, actually in, your, in your description, why don't you just go into that's a good segue. Why don't you describe, explain what, what you mean by democracy? What, what, how do you characterize democracy? Um, democracy is basically a system of government where <clears throat> um, the laws and um, basically the, the laws that are created under that system of government are created by either 
um, majority vote among the members or by majority vote among the representatives of those members of the society. Um, so as opposed to, let's say, a dictatorship or a monarchy where um, the laws are decided by a single individual, um, instead in a democracy, it's done by majority vote. Okay. Um, all right. So, so my definition of democracy would be, um, would, you know, would agree with that. It would be, you know, ma majority the majority of the population um, vote as to, you know, not necessarily what laws will be passed because we, you know, we have no choice in the matter, but we can vote as to which politician will represent us that will enact the laws, right? Um, but <clears throat> another way to describe it would be tyranny of the majority, right? Because in the democracy, individual rights are thrown right out the window because once you so, have, hold on. Wait, 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 let me just finish real quick. So, so once you sure. have a majority, right, regardless of what the minority wants, once you have a fifty-one percent vote, right, the, there's the the rights and and uh, and uh, you know uh, freedoms of the forty-nine percent are completely destroyed, completely thrown out. And, okay. Okay. So, so go well, on. Well, so first of all, fifty-one percent is an adjustable figure, right? So, if you don't believe that simple majority should be able to create the laws, you can adjust the number upwards. Maybe you think that two-thirds majority is sufficient in order to create laws. Um, so that that number is adjustable. Another thing uh, I would say is that what's what's the alternative from the creation of laws by the majority? If you agree that laws should exist, right? I mean, basically, you're arguing against laws. Like, you, you think that laws are bad because if you think that laws are okay, okay. Then, then how do you decide what the laws are? I mean, should it be minority rule? Should it be okay. one-person rule, right? Like, okay. you need some way of creating these laws. And <clears throat> if it's not by a majority of pe people thinking, thinking that this should be a law, then you basically you need some other system that is also sort of subjective, right? Okay, so, so that's a good segue, I think, into the definition of law. <laughs> mm -hmm. So sure. how would you characterize the definition of law? What is law? <sighs> um, okay, so we have a society. We have a grouping of people, right? A grouping of people living in a particular region. And a law is basically a rule that the people that live in the region cannot break. Otherwise, there are negative repercussions to it. Is that more or less right? Okay. All right. All right. So that's your... It is created by the government. But whatever, you know, whatever this entity that we call the government is, uh, the law that's created by this government, the people living within the jurisdiction could not break the law. Otherwise, there are some sort of negative repercussions. Right? Okay. All right. So my basic definition, like, boiled it down. Now, now the way I describe things, I try to boil it down to the simplest most straightforward explanation possible. That's right? exactly what I think I did, but so, go okay. ahead. Oh, but, okay, just, just uh, prefacing. Um, I'm so, not using words like tyranny or like dramatic, you know, okay. crime or whatever. Okay, okay. Go ahead. Um, okay, so basically to me, a law is an opinion backed by a gun, right? It's just somebody's opinion, right? And it happens to be the opinion of our politicians, right? And <laughs> the problem is, you know, when you give a small group of people near mm -hmm. unlimited power to make these arbitrary laws, you will inevitably have abuse, corruption, and... Uh, okay, you know. what if we had direct democracy? What if there were no politicians in the way? What if we didn't have representatives and we all electronically voted on laws? Would that still be... Okay, uh, well, well, well de mm -hmm. define what you mean by d direct democracy. As yeah. Direct democracy is basically a system by which individual members of the society um, basically have ideas for bills or laws that we should pass. Um, they submit these ideas, and then using, let's say, the internet or you know some simple means of communication, uh, we all read these laws, uh, educate ourselves on what they mean, and then we all individually vote using this system. So uh, you get rid of the legislators. And everybody individually is uh, responsible for recommending laws and voting for them. So who writes the laws? Uh, individuals, not so, politicians. So we all write the laws. Yeah, that's what electronic democracy means. As opposed to our system where we have representatives, you just get rid of the middleman and everybody uh -huh. basically manages democracy individually. So, so the way I, another way I look at a democracy is, um, is mob rule. So, for example, uh, mm -hmm. an, ex an example would be like, you know, <laughs> I didn't do anything wrong, but 
99 people want to kill me, <laughs> right? Want to hang me, right? So I don't want to get hanged, but 99 people vote for me to get hanged, right? <laughs> Let's say, and I, and I didn't commit a crime, right? So where or how is that justice? How is leaving control of society, of law, which is, which is basically, you know, uh, forcing people to act in a certain way at the threat of violence, leaving that even up to the majority does not necessarily produce uh, you know, wise or prudent results, right? Because people don't don't think wisely in a, in a, in a mob. <laughs> it's just basically democracy. People thinking in a mob. What, what would you? What do you think about that? So, I mean, when you use the word mob, it has sort of this like unreal, unruly connotation to it. It has this like idea of like fire and pitchforks and a bunch of angry people. Um, basically, my idea of a majority or a a um, you know, more people agreeing on something than not agreeing is sort of like what I would say is like the law of averages. Like, okay, if you take a sampling of millions of people and 5% of millions of people all agree that something is correct, right? Now, you can't count on those 75% of people to all be sensical or uh, correct or just beings, but... Um, as you get, as the sampling size gets pretty large, you would say that there's a very, very good chance that this 75% of people have what is probably a decent idea. Like 99% of people aren't going to want an innocent man to be hanged. I mean, do you think that that's the case? I, I would be extremely surprised if you take a sampling of any 100 random people and ask 99 of them if Danilo Cuellar, a perfectly innocent man like yourself, should be hanged. I don't think that most of the time you're going to get 99 people that would say that. So we're kind of trusting in our own you know, um, unification as a species that we're all kind of relatively sensible. And if we're not, we have much worse problems anyway, don't we? <laughs> so... That's what I think uh, the idea of a majority vote is, is kind of trying to get a great consensus of people agreeing that something is relatively reasonable or not. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so Much better than one person, isn't it? So, so, so another, um, another way I kind of, I kind of look at these, uh, these sort of concepts is like if, if we're stranded on a desert island, right, and you say you're mm -hmm. stranded with, you know, 49 other people, and, um, and so... What what do do people in that society you know? What would they feel like they need to do? Do they feel like they need to make someone king and have that person above the law and make all the rules? You know, <laughs> like like how would um, I mean? To me, what you're what you're advocating is not necessarily so different than true anarchy, right? Because because basically, I mean, in true in true anarchy. <laughs> nobody makes the rules like nobody individually you know we there's common understanding of morality which is what we all understand which is don't steal you know don't assault don't rape and don't murder right common basic sure. understanding of morality um, sure. and the problem is when we assign um, this distinction known as government which is itself immune to those laws of morality because they can do things that the average individual cannot do right they can murder people overseas and call it the war on terror right they can they can involuntarily <laughs> seize people's murder. funds in, involuntarily seize people's funds and call it taxation you can kidnap and cage people uh, and call well, it the war on drugs well there's a difference here so right? when you're saying that when you're saying that it's like murder and it's like theft there's a big difference when you murder somebody we didn't all like there weren't millions of people all, all kind of agreeing on what the correct thing to do here was. Like, you just decided of your own accord to go and murder someone. Whereas when we have military that are overseas and they kill another combatant in battle, we have all agreed together as a society that we are going to fund and empower a military to defend us. And one of the possible eventualities in defending our country may end up in the result of the killing of another combatant overseas, right? This may happen. But there's a big difference between, like, empowering a group of people to do something by mutual agreement and you individually going off and, like, murdering someone. I mean, it's completely, like, difference. Uh, there's a completely big difference there in terms of morality and in terms of, like, what is acceptable, right? 
I I I, uh, I sense that you that you're throwing around terms like we and us, you know, which is like collective terms, which which basically to me implies that a hundred percent of the population have you know consented to this particular hundred right? percent right yes a hundred percent of the population living in the united states has consented to having a military to help defend them yes no, that is true no well a hundred percent of the people i must be the only one then. their citizenship hold on you may not agree like you may choose to live here and still not like everything that occurs here but you are choosing to live here you are choosing to be a citizen of the united states and gaining all of the public service benefits that that citizenship entails, correct? Okay, can you can you tell me how I how I voluntarily chose to be a citizen? Uh, you were born here, and then at a certain point in your life, uh, you had the ability. Uh, let's say around age eighteen or whatever, right? You then became a fully fledged adult citizen of the United States, and you at that point, can, you know, assuming that you you had some sort of minimum level of funding to let's say move to Canada, at that point in your life, you said, hey, I don't mind it here. It's not too bad. I'm going to stay here, and I'm going to get gain a vote in my democratic government. I'm going to gain access to public transportation, public roads, um, f- you know, fire departments, police departments, all of these public services afforded to you with that citizenship, and you weren't going to give it up. So you stayed here. You made that deliberate okay. choice. Okay, so so I think um, one thing that I would disagree with that would be the principle that that coercion does not equal consent, right? So you're right in a sense that I am free to leave, right? Mm-hmm. However, <laughs> there there don't exactly exist uh, stateless societies anywhere I can go to where I can actually flee government itself, right? There are stateless. Societies. And why do you think that's the case? <laughs> Well, that's a separate issue, but I'm just saying, mm-hmm. I'm just saying it's not so easy to just flee to a stateless society, right? That's the first thing. And the second no, thing, okay, hold, but on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Oh, to oh, a country oh. that has much less government than we have, right? True, but, and but you pay much less taxes. True, true. And, and the way I look at that is like, um, <laughs> you know, like we're all, we're all swimming in a cesspool <laughs> and some people just want to move to an area of the cesspool where there's less feces, right? But anarchists actually want to step out of the cesspool <laughs> and leave it all together. <laughs> I'm pretty sure that if you wanted to move to like the Amazon jungle, where there's basically just tribes and not really much government at all, basically like your own little reclusive part of the earth, I'm pretty sure if you looked hard enough, you could find it, right? <laughs> okay. Not sure how many services or how free you would be okay. uh, by, uh, uh, by living there, but okay. you could find it. All right, so so let's go back go back to the citizenship. You could live thing. like a hermit, right? Yeah, yeah, it's true. I could, but uh, of course, mm-hmm. that's not exactly um, how you say um, realistic or you know feasible. Why not? <laughs> well, I mean, I'm not. I'm not you know realistic or feasible. I'm not self. I can't produce everything myself, right? I am dependent. You on, could. So, I'm dependent on you know merchants and people you know uh, trading you know me trading with them to to obtain the things i need but i'm not dependent on government See, uh-huh. that, that, that's the difference and i believe that the um separation of labor and this necessity of free trade directly implies government i believe once you have one you have the other so let's get to that discussion wait okay wait is it expand on that a little more um i basically believe that once we have the separation of labor like once we have agriculture which is producing more food than one person can consume and so then other people are freed up to do other things that don't depend on agriculture once you basically have the once you have agriculture and everything that agriculture implies that directly implies government like once you have one you have the other uh no that's what i would argue (laughs) i believe that once you have agriculture you need government to manage it okay all right, so so you're basically saying that um, as we have uh, progressed and um, industrialized, that the the appearance of authority and and kings and monarchs is inevitable, right? Basically, what you're saying. Um, I think that power is natural is a naturally occurring thing in human beings, and the accumulation of power is inevitable. Okay. Yes. All right. So so the way I would look at that is. Um, you know, th- this actually goes into our next uh, another question: Where does power originate? Right. So, mm-hmm. so the way I look at power is, um, you know, <laughs> like, like w- what gives the politicians, you know, 
power, right? The you know the things that they we write do. on pieces of paper. Okay, hold on, hold on. The things that they write on pieces of paper, right? They would be worthless. Nobody would pay attention to them except for what, right? And so a lot of people would say, well, except for the police, right? Except for the military, they are the enforcers. Well, you, well, uh, right. Laws are useless without enforcement, right? Yeah. Okay. Okay. I okay. could write. Oh. A, I could write a law myself on my desk right now if yeah. I wanted to. Exactly. Exactly. Nobody okay. would obey it. Okay. 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 Hold on. Let me just finish. So. So politicians and the military, well, politicians, you know, domestically, militarily, internationally, um, enforce the uh, the opinions of uh, of politicians, right? No, sorry, the police, you know, enforce the, the the opinions of politicians, right? Regardless if they are just or unjust, right? They are mindless well, order followers. Well, uh, I think that's, that's I think that's they're. a little oversimplification of it, right? Because we do have the judicial system. Like, there are other mechanisms by which laws are decided whether or not they are constitutional or not, whether or not they are just, whether or not they are properly enforceable. I mean, th it's not as simple as some politician somewhere writes some law, uh, then somehow gets a bunch of other p politicians to agree with him, and then somehow that law stays in place forever. That's just not how it works, right? They're, like our system is kind of built to sort of prevent the, the tyranny of like one politician affecting the vast majority of people. It's just not that simple. Yeah, so, so I, I remember in my government schooling, uh, the checks and balances, right? You have the executive, legislative, and judicial branch, right? And so <laughs> we were taught that there are checks and balances. They can, they can you know, monitor each other, prevent one from becoming too powerful. Um, and the system right. is not perfect. I agree with you on that. Yeah. Uh, so okay, so so primarily why I disagree with that system is because it is a monopoly on initiated aggression, right? You cannot you cannot overpower uh -huh. the government. You cannot overpower the police or the military. You cannot. They have all the guns. They have all the force yeah, and all and the violence on their side. So wait, hold on. Mm -hmm. Let me just finish. Hold on. So so when you say the judicial branch, you know, can render a law unconstitutional. You're right. In theory, it can. However, in 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 actuality, being a monopoly, right? It <laughs> you know, and 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 just imagine, you know, they're all being paid by the same. You know, they're all agents of the state, right? They're all being paid by by taxation. Same thing with state prosecutors. You know, all being paid. You know, the police all being paid by the same source, right? So, what kind of accountability can that? It's like it's like the fox guarding the hen house. You know. You know, the they they answer to each other. So there is no there is no incentive for actually pleasing the people because they mm -hmm. are a monopoly. They are in control. That mm -hmm. you know, okay. So go go ahead. What, what do you okay. Say? Um so first of all, I mean we are in control of their terms, right? So if they want to keep their job, if they don't want to face unemployment, um, they basically have to keep us happy, right? I mean that's the whole idea of representation in government is that someone else is representing your interests. And so in order to ensure that they continue to represent your interests, they have limited terms. And so if they want to run for the same office and, you know, continue having their control and monopoly of force over us, then um, <laughs> they need to basically, uh, within certain reason, keep us happy, right? Or at least distract us from the fact that they're not keeping us happy. Um, so that's true for the legislative and executive branches. The judicial is a little bit of a problem, and if we ever start to debate like aspects of the U.S. government and what we could do to ref uh, refine those, um, re refine it basically or improve it, um, one thing I would say is that since legislative or sorry, since judicial is appointed by executive, I think that that is like basically. My feeling is that the current U.S. government executive be has become too powerful, and so like. That is that is a problem with judicial, but in the other two branches, we basically are able to control who we have in office, and those people do have very different goals as to what they would want to see in our government. So things do change. Um, <clears throat> maybe not all the correct things change correctly all the time, but I think that goes back. I mean, basically, we're looking. F you're looking for a perfect system. I would say no perfect system exists. Okay. All right. So so the way I would um, look at our our system today, right? Like you said, you you know we we have control because we can elect who is mm -hmm. in power, right? In the seat of mm -hmm. power, right? Um, yeah. So there's a quote by I forgot who said it. He said um, the difference between a democracy and a dictatorship is um, in a democracy you vote first and then take orders, and in a dictatorship you just take orders. <laughs> you don't mm -hmm. vote. <laughs> and that that is essentially true, right? But that goes that all goes back to, as to whether or not laws are necessary, right? So like. 
laws are basically orders, and if laws are not necessary, then this is all a crack of shit, and we've all been basically obeying a system that is not even needed. Whereas if laws do exist, then, well, you need some sort of system to manage those laws, and some system where the people are, uh, th that obey them are empowering those who, like, are voluntarily choosing to empower those who are creating the laws, that is, about, that is about as fair as of a system that you could make, correct? If laws are necessary, democracy is kind of like the, one of the better ways of handling law creation, right? Okay, so, so you know... I so mean, is that true? Like, if laws are necessary, it's good that the people who create those laws are elected by the people that are obeying them. Is, I mean, that's basically true, right? Can you, like... Um, with me on that? I, don't, I don't even think that laws are necessary. So. Okay, so but I'm saying if they are, if they are, though. I mean, <laughs> I, I can't even accept the the, uh, the premise. Okay, <laughs> but sure. all right, all right, so let me just say, um, so you know, I, I think the idea of laws that that we need to have people in power, right, mm -hmm. writing down their their opinions about, you know how they can intervene and force people to conduct behavior that they would not necessarily do, um, the, that idea is fundamentally rooted in a distrust of humanity, in the, in the, in the assumption that humans are, are evil and will always tend towards violence, I don't think that's violence true. chaos, and... Oh, yeah. It's, it's the, to me, it's an idea of control, right? Controlling people's actions, right? That, that's the idea and this of law is, I think me. this is basically the root of where we disagree, right? My supposition is that humans are capable of a wide range of actions, right? They are not all good. Um, they are not all thinking of the public good when they perform actions. Some are. Some people are like you and me, right? We're generally good people. We want good for not only ourselves, our families, but we, gen we genuinely want good to happen for other people. And we're not willing to put ourselves above others. We're not willing to sacrifice others for our own benefit. That is not everyone. And w what I want to say is that government is not there to prevent everyone from doing what government wants. Basically, you need laws to... Uh, th there are bad apples in the bunches, right? There exist people that are not really looking out for you. They're looking out for themselves, and they're willing to perform actions that better themselves at the expense of others. Those types of people do exist. And basically, what government and police and jail and all that crap, what, what that's there for are the bad apples in the bunch, okay? In order for us to live all live together in harmony and achieve certain things together as a society... We kind of have to plan for the bad to happen. And when the bad happens, you know, those people are, you know, not allowed to get away with that in our territory without facing negative consequences. I don't expect everyone is evil. I expect that humans are capable of evil. Okay? okay. There's a big dis distinction there. Okay. Well, I'm not saying I'm, I'm assuming people are evil. I'm saying the idea of law is itself an assumption that people are evil and need to be controlled. That's what, that's what not like. everyone. So, not okay, everyone. Okay, okay, hold on, hold on. Let, let me just respond. So, um, Humans are capable of it. Okay. That's a very different distinction. Okay, okay. All right, so, so you said the existence of law and police and prison is for the few bad apples, right? So we, we, are, we require them to restrain the few bad apples, right? That's basically what you said. In order for us to live together in harmony and basically not have to look outside our car window to see if there's a gun being pointed at us all the time or whatever, okay. like okay. in order to basically live in a safe and free society uh, without like having fear, constant fear of like the bad apple in the bunch doing what they want with us, like this is the system that we've implemented. Okay, so so to me, the the, the fundamental um, um, error in reasoning with that is. It, it, it assumes that the people in power, the politicians, the bureaucrats, and the police are benevolent and angelic and will always serve the public good, right? They won't always. <laughs> I, don't, I never assume that they always so, will, right? And I don't assume that every single politician is angelic. What I do assume, though, is that people genu generally will make uh, good decisions in terms of who they elect, right? There's all this, like analysis like once you run for public office everyone basically knows everything about you right all of the all of your enemies on the other side analyze your life your history 
your public uh, records, everything that you ever wanted to hide about yourself becomes public. And after all of this careful analysis and all the stuff that ha happens to get out into the newspapers and the media and all the stuff about you <clears throat> should give people enough information to usually pick good choices as to who goes into public office. Is the process perfect? No. Are we perfect as human beings? No. Okay. Um, so, so the way I look at society and, uh, you know, the economy in general is, mm -hmm. um, you know, it's not something man-made, right? Like I think I explained to you uh, and, and I wrote before, it's not like a car, right, or a bicycle or a computer that was mm -hmm. man-made. It was constructed by somebody and therefore when it breaks down, you can send it to somebody who's going to fix it, right? A person can fix that, right? So to me, the economy and society is not man-made, right? It's like a jungle. It's nobody made it. It's the economy is the spontaneous, uh, is, is the result of people spontaneously coming together, trading, and and most of the time, always only in their in their uh, thinking of their own interests, right? So like you know the, the baker only thinks about baking bread to make money for his family, right? You know the butcher only thinks about getting meat. You know they're not thinking mm -hmm. about. They're not thinking sure. about like feeding, you know, kids across the an ocean, right? So, mm -hmm. so the way I'm okay, wait, let's finish. So, so in that way, that is, you know, the the sum total of all those transactions, all those people working in their self interest. That's what creates an economy, and mm -hmm. in in and in totality, when people do that in a large society, it's it's what's called spontaneous order, right? So, in this sense, the economy functions magnificently, just like they're there need be no authority figures dictating in the jungle which species to an extent. should live and which species should die in the same sense. To an extent. That's how I look at the economy. And once you apply laws and regulations and taxations to that spontaneously functioning organism, you will immediately cause detriment and harm. So, yeah. Okay. Um, understandable. So couple of things about a free market economy, right? A free market economy is only free so long as the people performing within the economy are free people, right? So like, for example, let's say I'm a big business and there's no monopoly on uh, military force, right? So anybody can have, um, can be armed, have a, you know, a militia, right? So theoretically, like a big business could end up hiring thugs, right? You could have people that are armed as part of your business, right? There's no problem with that. Now, let's say there's a much smaller company um, and they have a certain amount of money. Uh, let's say I want to acquire that smaller company. Now, in a free market system, their company is worth a certain amount of money. I just say, I'm going to purchase your company for this amount. And if you think that's a fair trade, I buy your company. Now, in this situation, let's say I want to acquire your company. I'll just send my mercenaries over, take over all your factories, and now I've gained quite a bit of value in my business, right, by taking your small business from you. So free market systems only work so far as the free market is free. When the free market is susceptible to military attack and things change hands beyond the business's control, that's a very different system entirely, no? Okay, okay, so now you're venturing into the hypothetical scenario of how, how a stateless society works. <laughs> oh, and I've got a lot of them. I've got actually a list right here. <laughs> yeah, I've you got, do. Like, this thing in Notepad I wrote up, this whole list of situations. Oh, man, it's going to be good. <laughs> I know, I know. So let's get into that. <laughs> so, so, okay, so it's kind of, you know, it's kind of hard, right, to, to debate what would happen in a stateless society because, you know, we really don't know. There is yeah. no precedent, you know, so there it's is. basically all conjecture. It's what you think is what I think, you know. Yeah. Um, so, it, you know, we can we can put forward these scenarios, right? And yeah. we can argue, you know, how people would behave. Uh, mm -hmm. But in the end, it's just conjecture. So, you know... Yeah, it, it, that, that's um, but why, what I would, that's what, what that's I would say, I, though, I shy, is you I, are I arguing against the status quo, right? There, There is a status quo that exists. I, I'm standing on thousands of years of human history, and you're sitting in an ocean of theoretical concepts. So... Basically, what you have to do is you have to propose you have to propose solutions for the problems that would ex that may come up or exist in your type of a society. I'll come up with some ideas, and you have to come up with theoretical solutions. 
Okay, well, well let me just start off with, with uh, I believe that would be the logical fallacy of the appeal to antiquity, right? So, so, so governments have been ex in existence for thousands of years, therefore it must be in existence or it must be moral. Well, or hold on, I'm not even existence. saying that because what I, all I'm saying is that I can come up with real examples of things that um, governments have done like to solve problems. Like if I'm coming up with a problem, I can tell you how governments in the past have solved them. That's all I'm saying. Okay. Whereas you have to kind of invent scenarios or, or give me explanations as to how you, how you would solve them in this new society. That's all I'm saying. I'm not saying that government is 100% necessary because it's existed in the past. I'm just saying I could, I'm sitting on all these examples. You're not. You have to come up with ways of solving this problem. That's okay, all I'm saying. Okay. So, so the way I would look at that is um, you know, I, would, I, would, I, always, I fall back a lot on the term democide, right? You're familiar with this term, right? What is it? De democide. Which is which is um, a government murdering its citizens, right? But the, uh -huh. and, th and this is not during this is not in time of war, right? You know this this occurred. You know the you know the Holocaust, right? The great pur um, the uh, Stalin's great purge, the great leap forward. Um, you know the Pol Pot. You know the you know. I mean, it basically occurs in our in parts of our society today, right? Like there's a um, death penalty, right? No, 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 no. More like, more like, um, you know, indiscriminate slaughter, like, uh, oh, 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 like, yeah. like, you know, the Native American genocide, or oh, in, oh, yeah. in Australia, the Aboriginals were, you know, wantonly killed. Um, uh -huh. Yeah, you I know what democide is. Sure. Okay, yeah. So, so things like that. So, so that just looking at the 20th century, okay, because the 20th century is basically the century of beginning, uh, the beginning century of perpetual warfare. You know, the world wars, indeed, right? So, so. Um, you know, with not not looking at the world wars, the number of people that have died due to oppressive regimes, primarily communism, um, which uh -huh. arguably our country is well on the path towards communism, um, uh -huh. the number of people that have died is in the ballpark of 250 million, right? Just from government alone, right? Not not as a result of war, right? And so, to me, that is. Uh, <laughs> That's pretty appalling. Like, like you know. So, so if you want to look at the history uh -huh. of what government has done, it's it's pretty horrific. You know, hold pretty on. Atrocious. The history of what humans have done, right? The the history of what humans have. You're done. right. You're right. Humans that called themselves mm -hmm. government, they called themselves authority, and they said, "I'm just obeying the law. This is my job." Like, well, what did the SS the SS soldiers during the Holocaust? You know, they sent these Jews off to die in the gas chambers, right? And what For did they sure. say? This is just my job. I was just obeying orders, right? That's what they said at the Nuremberg trials. I was just mm -hmm. obeying orders, which is exactly what the U.S. military people say overseas in in the Middle East when they when mm -hmm. they you know you know <laughs> knock down people's doors and like you know murder rape and kill people. I'm just obeying mm -hmm. orders. In exactly what the police say in this country when when they you know uh, you know uh, <laughs> kidnap and beat up people and murder people and they are mm -hmm. completely free of repercussion I'm just obeying orders right mm -hmm. so to me w once you once you create a an institution that we call mm -hmm. government you have completely yeah. um, separated yourself from the laws of morality you give these people a special a special okay. Uh, and all, and and so all of this that you're talking about right now, all of this stuff that you're saying that gov government has caused, all of this is um, unpreventable if government is necessary, right? It's just a consequence of, I mean, countries fighting versus un other countries is inevitable if government is necessary, right? If government is unnecessary, then yes, all of this crazy stuff we've been doing for the past thousands of years is ridiculous, right? So it all just comes back to whether or not government should exist, right? It's basically what it all comes back to. And, and, another, the, and right, also ahead. another thing, just one second, yeah, go ahead, go ahead. is whether or not war is a part of human nature, right? Whether or not distrust of other groupings of people uh, na like occurs, occurs naturally. And like, what is the nature of war? Why, why do we fight each other? Like... Do civilizations compete against each other and eventually desire the other civilization's land? Like, is is that a naturally occurring thing? Is genocide or like is this like are these things all things hap that happen because we have governments or are they things that happen because we are people? 
That's my, you know basically what you the questions you have to answer because well, if they're not attributable to government, then government has nothing to do with it, right? Okay, okay. So, <clears throat> so you know we, we keep saying the word government like as if it's like a separate entity, but you're right. It's just people, right? So, mm -hmm. so the the that's why I mentioned before in the beginning in my definition of government, it's propped up by the belief in the myth of authority, right? So, uh -huh. so the the belief that some people are special, right? Some people uh -huh. can rob. Assault, rape, and murder, yeah, free of repercussion because they are authority. That is the belief mm -hmm. in the myth of authority, and it is only given power by the people, right? Because the people yes. far outnumber the politicians on sure. Capitol Hill, even the police. We far outnumber the police. If if three hundred for sure, if three hundred thirteen million people really wanted absolutely <clears throat> to get rid of government, the police yeah. would not be any hindrance whatsoever. Right. Mm -hmm. Forget about all the all the weapons. Absolutely. Right. right? Mm -hmm. So so it's not. <clears throat> it's it, fundamentally it's not really that um, they can overpower us. It's basically that we have been indoctrinated through our government schooling to. I mean, indoctrinated is a strong word, but sure. Or yeah, raised. I mean, just think. Okay, so so talking about government school, you know, it's funded by taxation, right? So it is a it is a it is an agency of the state, right? Department mm -hmm. of Education, right? So mm -hmm. of course you would expect that the things that will be taught in government school would be in support of government. That is only natural. Yeah, only I mean, natural. that may happen. That may happen in, in countries where, like, in, Germ you know, Nazi Germany, like, school was very much um, teaching you about how great Hitler was and, you know, the Nazi regime and all that. Um, I mean, I feel like, personally... Uh, of course, you know, I'm supposed to believe this, right? The, you know, the system's gotten to me. But, um, <laughs> you know, I personally feel that during my time in public school, which you also attended, yep. we learned a lot about the, both the good things and the bad things that happened not only in world history, but in U.S. history. And we also learned about many different types of government other than democracy and how they function and how the things that were written about them, the countries that have tried those types of governments out. Um, it's not like I feel that you know, after looking at publicly, like, internet-based forms of public records, things that people across the world have contributed to, I don't feel that those records can, like, compete very much with the records that I learned about during public schooling. Like, I don't think that much was covered up, and anything that I want to learn about that people across the world have contributed to, nothing, like, there's no, like, crazy secret thing that's happened that, um, there's public records about that I don't know about. Of course, there's things that have happened in government that are secret because of, you know, defense and all that, um, you know, but whatever. Like, aside from that, I don't feel that, like, government school is brainwashing me into believing these things that don't exist. Okay. Um, so, so I've done a little bit of research into the origin of, uh, of public school, and, um, and it actually um, started in the, I, think, I believe, the mid-19th century when a guy went over to Prussia and okay, uh, I think that's a really good discussion that maybe we should have another time. But I, I want to get to the nature of power. Like, oh, okay, okay, I'm sorry. What, All right, what no is problem. power? No and like, is is the existence of power like replicated in places other than government? Right? Like, is there power that is non-governmental that is kind of popped up through him, human history? Right? Okay. Um, so first of all, what is power? And so the definition of power, as I'm reading it from a dictionary, um, you know, that is online, probably controlled by our government or whatever. Uh, it says, <laughs> it says, uh, power is the capacity or ability to direct or influence the behavior of others or the course of events. So power just, it doesn't necessarily have anything to do with like military might or physically forcing people to do things or using the threat of physical force. It's just the capacity to influence the behavior of others, right? So let's talk about religion, right? Religion is something that has nothing to do with control of an area. It's basically, I mean, let's talk about what a priest is, right? I think this is actually really interesting. So what is a, what is a priest of like, let's say the Catholic church, right? A priest is a man who somehow gets a bunch of people that some of them he may know, some of them he may not know. He gets a bunch of people to come to a room for about an hour every week, uh, listen to him talk from a book that someone wrote before about a being that nobody in the room can prove exists. And then at some point during that hour, a box gets passed around and everyone but the priest puts money into it. 
Now, okay. that's power, right? <laughs> this guy is a powerful guy. He talks about some stuff for an hour and people give him money. I mean, I mean that's powerful. And also, he convinces them of certain moral codes. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife. And thou shalt not do all these things. And nobody's physically forcing anyone to believe or to, to follow these things. They just kind of do it. And that's basically a manis- manif- manifestation of power. I mean, the Pope of the Catholic Church, he's a powerful guy. Would you not agree? I mean, people across the world that have nothing to do with the Vatican or that piece of territory believe that this man speaks from God. And what he says is the, God, the God's honest truth, to lack of better terms. And uh, when he visits places around the world, people from, you know, the President of the United States meets with him. And people, thousands of people gather to listen to what he has to say. I mean, this is a powerful guy and yet has nothing to do with government. And so <coughs> I think that the ability to manipulate others is just a skill that some people have. Some people, like the CEO of my company... I can tell you a funny situation. People, people like angry clients that we have call up our company and they're like, you better fix this. And, you know, I'm not paying you the maintenance hours this month. I want this done right now. And the person talking to them, the project manager is like, there's nothing I can do to make this guy feel better. You know, this guy is, I, I, I can't do anything for him. They send him to the CEO. The CEO talks to him on the phone for 10 or 15 minutes and hangs up the phone and says, the client could never be happier. I don't know what the heck he tells the guy on the phone. I don't know if it's like blowjobs or what. I don't know what he's convincing him of. But somehow, he's able to appease this client that no one else in the company can. And there's just these people that have good person skills. They're just good at handling and talking to people. And they get others motivated behind them. And they lead companies. Or they become presidents of countries. Or they become the pope. Or what have you. These things occur. Um, so what do you have to say to, to that? Okay, so the first thing I would say is um, I believe that the, um, the modern day state, uh, the institution of government, is the religion of modern day. <laughs> in that, in the and past. Yesterday, I suppose, right? It's, I mean, it's existed well, well, yeah, since but, but a long it's, time but, ago. But, but mm-hmm. now, especially now, of course, you know, the United States has ballooned to be the largest superpower the world has mm-hmm. ever seen, the largest sure. nuclear superpower. And, mm-hmm. and so, so, yeah, so now it's even more pronounced than ever, right? So, so in the past, you had the, the merger between church and state, right? So, sure. so this is basically what, what gave um, power in terms of the ability to, you know, um, you know well, inflict physical violence on people, let's say, who, who didn't believe in the church. You know, that's what basically gave them power was the merger with the state. Once you have the separation of church and state, the church... It's it's it, it does have authority. Like people do believe, of course, but they don't have that power to to you know <laughs> invade people or infl- inflict physical violence on people. You know, it's all voluntary, basically. Whereas uh-huh. the difference is with a government. Okay, mm-hmm. it is also um, empowered by belief. Okay, belief in the myth of authority that some people have a special right to rule and I don't know and, if there's a myth are, of authority okay, wait, that's kind of my whole argument is okay, that authority okay, wait, 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 is not wait, wait, a myth it okay, is naturally okay, forming but okay, go ahead. so the belief that some people are exempt from the laws of morality and can therefore act with impunity no right? that the other president people of the cannot. United States needs to follow the law just like I do all right so all right so so this is a good this is a good uh, topic to discuss um, do you consider the president a mass murderer absolutely not He's the chief. He's he is the chief, the the commander in chief of our armed forces, which we have authorized. We meaning representatives I, I, I of our government that we have elected. No, I didn't. I didn't yes, authorize you have. <laughs> you have <laughs> by author- being a citizen of the United States. I wasn't asked about about authorization of the military. No, nobody asked me. Nobody sent me that letter. <laughs> but but anyway, but what no, I'm, what but I'm, at. What but at about- an age of consent, you okay. have agreed to continue staying here and being a citizen of the United States and gaining access to our public defense that we have called our armed forces. You are gaining benefit of having that protection. And therefore, if you do not want those that protection, you basically can try to have it change because we live in a democracy. Or there's the door, right? Like, you have a choice. 
Actually, actually, uh, the idea that government protects the rights of the citizens is, I think, another flawed idea because uh, the essence of government is itself um, a violation in violation of individual rights, referring to tax the involuntary payment of taxation, right? We have no choice it, because it, it is a monopoly, right? We have no choice but to pay our taxes, and also it has you a monopoly a on it has a monopoly on law. We have no choice but to but to obey the law, or else we would get visited by armed thugs who will <laughs> kidnap and cage us. And right? if these laws get wildly, wildly uh, out of hand, right? If vast injustices are being performed by these laws, right? We one will not like the people that put these laws in place and get people that will have put better laws into place that are not as unjust. Or two, we will find a better country to live in that has less, less uh, unjust laws, right? Has jo uh, laws that we better agree with. And so there are alternatives, right? Like this is not, nobody's chaining you in your house to your computer talking on Skype to me and not letting you go, right? So if there is a voluntary um, willing to, willingness to stay in the territory where all these other people want these things and you don't, uh, well, then you don't have to stay there, right? Yeah. Nobody's evicting you, but you're, you're, you're welcome to not, not have to be subject to those laws, right? Yeah, yeah, you're right. So, so the, the idea that... Um you know, of slavery. So the idea of, of, of slavery, right? So in the past, we had chain slavery, right? So you had the mm -hmm. physical ownership of human beings yeah, um, that 100% that right. of, of the fruits of their labor was stolen, right? Okay. Privately, so then, right? Pri by private individuals. No, 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 no. This was sanctioned by government. This was enabled and sanctioned by government. There, was, there were laws put into place at that time that enabled no, slavery. Like government, right, so slavery wasn't ag against the law, but the people doing the enslaving was not the government. They weren't going over to Africa, capturing people, and then selling them to private individuals. Private individuals were going over to Africa, selling them to other private individuals, and then those private individuals owned other slaved individuals, right? Government only just did not outlaw this practice. Government did not say, hey, this guy in Africa, you're now a slave. That was all privately done, right? So, I mean, so, so, we have to disambiguate so, 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 these I, things because I, so, you're, you're kind of overgeneralizing. Okay, so, that, so this is where we come into the, uh, <laughs> we get, uh, how do you say, uh, in disagreement over history. <laughs> in a revisionist history, okay? So I'm, I'm, I'm basically arguing the complete I opposite. Mean, so slavery could happen in an, in, in an anarchist civilization, right? So, so you have, you know, uh, you know, a slave master, let's say, who has, let's say, 30 slaves, right? So, mm -hmm. so what, is, what is to keep that, those 30 slaves from just revolting and killing their slave master? What prevents that, the slaves from doing that? What, what do you think? Um, so probably the, the slave master is rich and armed. And so, so basically they could leave, but they may get shot. Okay, um, highly the unlikely. Slaves don't have guns, but the master does. One person uh, enslaving 30 people, highly unlikely. So, so basically, what, what, from my understanding of history, <laughs> from, uh, from alternative... Hold on, so like, usually plantations are an entire family, though. Okay, so let's say a wife and a husband, <laughs> even still. You know, let's say, let's say and kids. some children. And some children. <laughs> okay, you have 30 you know, adult uh, human beings there, angry human beings... Mm -hmm. You know, one day decide to revolt. There is no stopping them. All right, doesn't matter how many how many how many guns you have. There's, you just have let's say four or five people. Maybe they're not going to restrain thirty people. Right. So so it's not the fact that um, you know it, it, there's just these individuals that are forcing the slaves to be there. No, it's it's that there were there were bounty hunters. Right at that time, there were fugitive slave laws at that time. That if a slave were to escape, right, their slave master, that Agents of the state, bounty hunters, would capture them and bring them back to. That their could also master. be done privately, though, right? 
I mean, you could pay some. You could pay somebody to go hunt down your slave. It's not necessarily like government is okay. necessary for slavery to exist. Okay, you could have good, slavery in an anarchist state, right? Okay, that's a good. That's a good. That's a good um, concept to discuss. Also, is slavery an efficient business model? <laughs> right? Can you make? Yes. Can you make an efficient very business efficient. doing slavery? Right. And Absolutely. I, okay. It's explain very efficient. Ex- explain to me how how you you see it as being efficient. Okay. So basically, for a one time fee. For life, you get labor, and it doesn't cost you anything thereafter, right? The only thing it costs you is the cost of keeping them in line. Other than that, it's extremely efficient, right? You get people to do your work for effectively over the, lo- the course of a full life free, right? And also probably any of their children, I mean, if you have them breed or whatever. Like, it's highly efficient. You get work output for very little investment. Isn't that very efficient? Okay. So I would completely disagree. <laughs> so I, the way I look at slavery, Why? okay, okay, let me tell you. So the way I look at slavery is extremely inefficient, right? So you have to, you, so you mentioned this, right? You have to feed them, you have to clothe them, you have to give them shelter, and then you have to force them, you have to whip them into submission, right? Beat them, right? Into submission. Now, now, the, hold on. The, okay, now. hold on, hold on, hold on. So, mm-hmm. so, so the productivity of a person that is involuntarily forced, so the productivity of a person that's involuntarily forced to do work compared to a person that is, let's say, compensated monetarily to do work, the the person that is forced to do work, I would imagine, would be much less, much less efficient, right? Because uh-huh. because you have s- substantial resistance, right? People don't like to be controlled. <laughs> it's just the nature of humanity. People don't like to be controlled. So I, I completely do not see um, how people it would be also like at all. to survive. You're right. You're right. People like people also like living, right? You're right. Yeah. So so let's 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 say the worst worst possible scenario is that somebody who is enslaved is half as efficient as someone who is paid, right? I mean that that seems like a pretty generous estimate. Like let's say a slave is just eh, I don't really want to work, but if I don't work, I'm going to die. So I'm just going to work, but I'm not going to be as efficient as somebody who's paid. Let's say they're half as efficient, right? But let's say that you paid a hundred thousand dollars. I don't know. We're coming up with arbitrary numbers, but let's say you paid some amount to buy the sleeve. Uh, and let's say like over the span of five years, you pay a, a wage worker that much money. I mean, you're still getting like 50 years of more labor out of that person for effectively free. Right. I mean, well, you're not, you're not taking, you you're not taking into keep... account all, all the other all the other costs, right? Sh- food, clothing, shelter, right? I mean, all, all that. You're not taking that into it. I mean, that's, <laughs> that's a those are important. I mean, to yeah. have somewhere where they can sleep is. I mean, let's talk about if I'm going to go live in an apartment, I'm going to be paying like this place. I'm considering pay, uh, uh, this place. I'm considering. I'm going to be paying like two thousand something a, a month to live. Now, if you just put somebody in a a hut and uh, feed them bread and water or something, like, I mean. <laughs> <laughs> it would be extremely profitable for there to be slavery right now. Would it be also extremely amoral? Yes. It would be horribly amoral. I mean, uh, there's a reason why plantation uh, plantation owners wanted slavery. is very cost effective. They did not I want guess, slavery to go away. Okay. They were going to lose lots of profits if slavery went away. That's why they fought so much for it, man. Okay, so... so um... Well, another thing with your bread and water slave is that you're not taking into account the declining health of a bread and water diet, right? Yeah, so, sure, so, right. So, you so you're going to nourish them to a certain extent. I mean, you don't want them to die. You want them to be able to work efficiently. It's so you're not, not going to feed them the trashiest of the trash food. But you're not going to treat them like kings either. No. I mean, you're not going to like give them filet mignon for dinner every night. I mean, you know, there's certain limits to what you're gonna, how you're going to treat this guy because you have the force by, with, by which to keep him subjugated. And this could be done in any sort of uh, civilization, be it government-based or non. So, so this is actually a, a good segue into another concept that I was thinking about. So, um, mm-hmm. so the idea of slavery, I draw a parallel, chain slavery, I draw a parallel to, to government of today. Right? Which is hilarious, but because, conti- okay, continue. Right, they're both involuntary. But anyway, so, so the abolitionists of the time during the early 19th century, right, advocated for the abolition of slavery, not because they foresaw how society would be absent slavery 
right? Not because they foresaw the, the, the huge industrial machines that would, that would till the soil and feed 7 billion people. No, they, they oppose slavery on moral grounds, right? They oppose it because it's immoral to own sure. a human being, right? Yeah. In the same sense that modern-day yeah. anarchists or voluntarists are, are modern-day abolitionists as well. We oppose the state because it is... It is the involuntarily economic slavery, economic in the sense that it's not chain slavery, right? We don't have 100% of our, mm -hmm. of our fruits of our labor stolen. We have 40%, <laughs> right? So if I put a gun to your head and I tell you, give me 10 cents of every dollar that you earn um, or I'm going to imprison you or kill you, right? You're like, all right, here's 10 cents. So now what's to stop me from saying, give me, give me all of your money? And what are you going to do about it? You can't do anything, right? Because I have the gun and I have the violence, right? So once you give a, a, a monopoly of violence, known as government, mm. control yeah. over society, mm. there is no restrictions. There is no inhibitions, no voting, no electoral process. <laughs> it's, to me, all of that is mere show. It's pomp, it's ritual, and it's superficial display. <laughs> mm -hmm. So... <laughs> So that's, that's, that's the parallel that I draw uh, modern-day government with chain slavery. So, so you know, modern-day abolitionists don't oppose the state because we understand exactly to a T how we would live in a stateless society and how every single scenario would, would play out. We oppose it on moral grounds, right? That, that you know, the, the involuntary theft known as taxation is immoral and people are, you know, should <laughs> retain 100% of the fruits of their labor. <laughs> and we can have mm -hmm. roads, we can have security, private security, we can have departments that would put out fire privately, we can have third, third party dispute resolution mm -hmm. agencies, you know, these mm -hmm. are not necessarily, um, they, they don't have to be government provided. So, mm -hmm. so, so basically, I, there's like two major issues with that. So one is, <clears throat> you believe that it's involuntary, I would say that it is completely voluntary, right? So, I mean, for the reasons that I've said before, you know, citizenship is a, uh, is a voluntary thing. <clears throat> and so then the other, the other thing I would argue is that all of these situations that you're describing that would be doable in a stateless society are not actually very doable. And I think that's probably going to be the subject of the next video is like how you're actually going to handle all these situations that are going to come up related to um, the ones I have here is uh, trespassing, how do roads work? How, do, how does fire prevention work? How does this dispute resolution work? How does national defense work? What happens when there's an accident? Does big business equal big military? And what happens to the handicapped? I think these are all like really good things to bring up in the next video. All right. Awesome. Excellent. Yeah. yeah we got it was a really good debate. I really enjoyed it. I hope the, f the viewers enjoyed it. Um, I really enjoy you having me on here. And uh, it harkens back to our days of uh, high school and getting off the bus and <laughs> talking about all these crazy things. So nice, it was with, awesome with, with an apple with an apple in my hand, right? <laughs> <laughs> yep. Yep. All right, awesome, John. So uh, thanks a lot for the conversation. Yeah, so, thank you, thank you. It was great. No problem. So this is um, this concludes the first part of our debate. Well, hopefully we're going to do a second video of mm -hmm. uh, between uh, you know defending anarcho capitalism and uh, direct democracy. So this is. Um, this is Voluntary Virtues Network, uh, Peaceful Anarchism. Uh, wishing all of you have a wonderful day. Take care. All right. Bye. Take care, guys. Bye-bye.